Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome back to another edition of Foreclosure Pedia Podcast. Foreclosure Pedia Podcast presentation, Foreclosure Pedia Radio Network. It premieres each Sunday evening at 2300 hours. I want to take a couple minutes this evening and uh, talk to everybody a little bit about, uh, about the Guild, the National Property Preservation Guild, the uh, state of the affairs in the industry, and uh, what precisely is going on. You know, a little background on the Guild. <clears throat> we uh, we put, the, put together the Guild. It originally started as the East Tennessee Property Preservation Guild several years back. And uh, a lot of us up here actually, we all had the same sentiment that we, we were not being paid properly for the services that we were be we were rendering to the companies and our main rationale behind that wasn't just that the monies being paid for the services weren't enough they didn't even come close to what minimum wage might be the other problem is East Tennessee is is very unique in its geography the average 10 or 20 mile trip consumes three to four times the amount of gasoline that uh, that you would say in Florida or Ohio or California or or other areas like that and uh, so that was our initial our initial issue with that the other issue was that we were finding that some of the nationals were actually beginning to to just flood <clears throat> our area of operation with uh, with a bunch of outsiders they would come in with with their attitudes and uh, they really disrespected the locals around here you know the one thing we all of us should never forget is that losing one's home is a traumatic experience regardless of whether or not the bank is or is not entitled to that property and I'm not going to get into that because that's a whole nother issue that's a whole nother issue that's actually working its way up to the United States Supreme Court the reality is that these are human beings and uh, you know these outsiders would come in and uh, very rudely and disdainfully treat uh, our you know friends and neighbors because that's how we look at these people even though we're in this industry we try we try to bring to bear just a just a little bit of humanity upon the situation we're there to do a job we're gonna do that job but we don't have to come in with a flyboy attitude. And that's what was happening. East Tennessee was also unique in the fact that uh, they couldn't find a single company to cover the whole area. Foreclosurepedia, and this is us as a company, we cover now approximately 15,000 square miles. Crystal, uh, myself, and other people who actually work for us we actually cover this area now buying through the guild we cover and maintain through 11 states but we actually still work in the field so the first first thing we had to address was if we were going to put together a guild if we were <clears throat> going to reach out to other contractors how precisely would we do that and how would we create an organization that was both bulletproof and had no ability to be corrupted well what we actually did was we looked at the industry we looked at the corporations out there and what we found was the single common indicator of corruption of greed was money so the guild leadership in no way, shape, or form has the ability to be financially compensated. Very, very dissimilar than a union. The guild is not a union. It is not an association either. It is not even a quote-unquote legal entity. So <clears throat> we hammered out in the Constitution, which we're going to look at here in a little bit, hammered out the fact that none of the leadership could be paid. Now, with the exception of if we travel 
you know, to give speeches or something to other regions. We felt that, you know, people whom were traveling, we, if the monies that are generated, there are, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars here and there that are generated. But uh, we felt we should at least pay for their meals. And if there was a little money left over, we'd try to compensate gas. So I suppose there is a little per diem. But I don't anticipate the corporate world being able to come in and, and you know, offer maybe a half dozen Ruth, Ruth Chris uh, uh, gift certificates and you're going to corrupt the guild. It's not going to happen. The other thing that we we looked at when we, we actually put together the Constitution was when we looked at corporate structure and we when we looked at the, the government and when we looked at how unions were formed, we noticed that the, the hierarchy at the top of that food chain, the national level, was dictating policy. And in property preservation, we found that that doesn't work. Uh, a national organization that is uh, geocentrically located in one area is in no position to determine uh, a, a blanket protocol on how things should or should not be done with the exception of education. Obviously if you take for example winterization, a winterization is going to be done <clears throat> the same whether it's in Los Angeles or Detroit Miami perhaps uh, it's going to be done the same way with the exception also you know you have dry and and wet uh, winterizations <clears throat> you guys will have to excuse me this evening I'm kind of down with the flu it seems to be going around everywhere <clears throat> so that's what we did we structured it in such a way that all national does and when I say national I'm talking about the leadership in, in the national at the National and General Headquarters, uh, GHQ, all we really do is we look at the industry, we prepare an educational format, we uh, we use our resources and our our uh, intelligence connections that we've fostered over the years, uh, both by what I bring with myself from my former uh, days and years with the government and also others who work with us. We try to bring that information to the regionals so they can better cope and, and better draw, if you will, their own game plans up. The other thing that we do uh, is we interact at the legislative levels. Uh, you guys have probably noticed on the site uh, not only do I get down in the trenches and ask the pointed questions that everybody is terrified to ask, I also submit the legal questions. You'll see here recently we actually uh, submitted a FOIA Act inquiry, not a request, but an inquiry to Craig Carnes, whom is the uh, Atlanta HUD POC. He's the guy who actually pins the contracts. Uh, we asked the questions of outfits like PK management. We asked the questions of outfits uh, such as A to Z, City Side, uh, et cetera, ad nauseum. And generally we get the answers. And the reason we do that is it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you think about the United States and you think about, let's use a round number, let's say 10,000 contractors. If every company had to respond to 10,000 con contractors' questions and inquiries, they'd never get any work done. It just wouldn't happen. And so what we try to do is we try to correlate the data and the information, and uh, we try to then, then uh, uh, dis distribute that out to our regionals. Every regional has something different that they're, they need information on and, and how to instruct their boots on the ground. Another prime example on why national does not dictate to regional, I was uh, recently speaking with some people out in Nevada. And you know here in East Tennessee we, we, have, a, we, we have a prolific problem with mold. Um, and so thus accordingly our regionals out here we have to speak with the contractors about mold, what products to be using, whether or not they need certifications, depending, and there's a lot of legalese involved in this, 
which National also addresses. We, we, we try to be at the forefront to make sure that the get members of the guild are, are well appraised of what their, their status is. We do not offer legal advice. We only offer educational assistance. But with that said, the people out in Nevada, by and large, don't deal with mold. So it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for a national entity to instruct all its regionals to maintain equipments and, and products and, and, th and, and even an educational process that required them to spin up mold models. So once again, the regionals. The regionals have the power and control. The concept of the guild in and of itself is a very decentralized system. For example, and, and, and it's the only way I can make a comparison, if you look at something like NAMFS, National Association of Mortgage Field Services, they, uh, they are an organization that, that interacts with the government, interacts with, uh, with the corporations, and I, I suppose at some level they interact with some contractors. I tend to call them order mills. You know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. That's a personal opinion. But by and large, their whole policy decision-making structure occurs from the top down. Uh, and that probably works in that industry and, and for what they do because by and large, when you look at its leadership, you're dealing with with uh, people from LPS, uh, McCall's, uh, Safeguard, outfits like this. The Guild, on the other hand, <clears throat> we, uh, we just don't find that to be a palatable model. A, because we don't charge our members any dues. So, once again, no financial interest there. The, the, only, the only money money generating mechanism or revenue, if you will, that comes into the guild is, is the use uh, of our logo uh, has a licensing fee of $125 a year. No one's required to even use it. Some of our contractors do because I, I suppose some of them actually like to say, hey, you know, we're supportive of contractors organizing and being together as a brother and sisterhood, proverbially speaking. Some of them actually have told us, uh, this is more at the realtor level, a lot of our, we get a lot of work, um, a lot of work requests from local realtors whom actually are so fed up with Safeguard, so fed up with AMS REO, so fed up with the corporate infrastructure that they actually reach out. Uh, we actually just had two calls yesterday. We went out to clean up a house. Um, local realtor here in the Knoxville area had a sale. The buyer had asked for two weeks for that lawn to be mowed. This was a HUD property, incidentally. I'm not going to say who maintains it. I'll tell you it's a HUD property. They couldn't even get these people to mow the lawn. The inside was filthy. There were feces in the toilet. And, you know, I don't know. Uh, somebody dropped the ball. Why it was dropped, I don't know. But anyway, so they contacted us. We went out and cleaned it. Uh, they have an anticipated sale on Tuesday. So the local realtors, at least here, and quite a few local realtors as you go through the Midwest. We do a lot of work in, in Oklahoma, in Kansas, in Nebraska. All the time we have realtors reach out to us or members of the guild. <clears throat> and I suppose the, uh, the realtors must have their own network and, and they seem to be quite comfortable seeing the guild symbol because they know. They know that when somebody from the NPPG, when a member of that guild shows up to do work, they know it's going to be done the right way each and every day. The same way, the same time, each and every time. That's why in the guild, we uh, we actually pioneered a model, and I, 
I, uh, I use the euphemism that it is the Big Mac model. And what the Big Mac model is, whether it's a, once again, a winterization, a lock change, uh, how the lawn is cut, <coughs> excuse me, whatever it might be, the product that is delivered is going to be delivered the same way in Los Angeles as it is in Washington State, in Seattle, SeaTac, Puyallup, uh, Spokane. It's going to be delivered the same way in Detroit, uh, the same way in Concord, New Hampshire, the same way in Washington, D.C., Knoxville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, Dallas, Texas, or God forbid, Miami, Florida. The pricing. The pricing is a little more on the front end. Not much. A couple of three points. We don't think 3% on, on what's being paid out now since it doesn't even meet minimum wages very much. But when the actuaries, the bean counters, sit down, and make no mistake, they do sit down, as do the realtors. The realtors, we actually have an enormous and, and an inordinate amount of support from. Each and every time they tell us, you know what? If we're paying 5 or $8 more for this initial service to occur, for this product to be delivered, it's worth it because why? It's delivered right the first time. The set of pictures are right the first time. The documentation is right the first time. Now, by way of comparison, when you look at outfits like Safeguard, AMS, REO, these other run-of-the-mill corporations, they're going back two, three, four times. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But once again, I, I, I'm not in the corporate world. Thank God for that as well. Back more on point onto the guild. Structuring of the guild. How exactly is the guild set up? We well, can see this map right here. These are the regions and how it's broken up. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the exception of down in here, and we actually now have a contractor in Alaska. We also do not have membership in Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands. Every other state we have membership in. We have a higher and heavier concentration of membership in other states, uh, you know, than others. We feel it's a movement that is gaining momentum. This week alone, uh, I've had 117 inquiries. These are separate inquiries. Um, so we do feel it's gaining momentum. We've also had inquiries from the United Kingdom, from Canada, from France, from Germany. Uh, we just had an inquiry from Spain, Barcelona. Uh, they are all very interested. Uh, and, and so the problem actually posits for us wherein we were thinking domestically it's looking like this may very well be an international situation not surprising though really because when you look at the same corporations that created this mess this mess was dumped on the on Wall Street when all these mortgages were bundled up as securities and when they hustled that and they ended up hustling our own government to pay them out well, those in, in Europe and in, in other countries whom had invested in those securities, they have the same business we have here. Actually had to uh, get a translator because uh, I, I do read, write, and speak Spanish amongst other languages. However, uh, you get into what's called a vosotros and a nosotros uh, differentiation in language, and so Spain is a little bit different. Had to get a translator. So as you look at this map, ideally, each one of these numbers represents a region. And regionally, a guild has spun up. What does spinning up mean? What does it mean to you? What is a regional guild? What does it do for you? This is the Constitution that was adopted back in March. Uh, We'll go over it a little bit. The name, 
The aims pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to take proactive steps to address nationally deteriorating rates of pay, the objects, powers of the guild. Not much. We can raise funds, I guess, with cookies. We could open a bank account, uh, take on and lease property. Two of our investors within corporate America actually handle that for us nationally. Employee staff. <clears throat> These are individuals whom are not leadership within the guild. For example, we, we, we have a vast intelligence network. So from time to time, we expend funds for information uh, specific to whether it's people, corporations, information. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, advisory committees, the membership, this is pretty key. To be a member, your overall income has to be generated by at least 25% of tangible field operations. Now I want you all to think just a moment. Can you name me one person in NAMFS who is scrubbing toilets daily? Can you tell me one person over there in its executive leadership that is cutting lawns? that is removing debris, that is hanging signs. I can't, perhaps you can. This gets into the national infrastructure of the guild, how we vote, the quorum, Robert's rule of order, uh, general meetings. It's all pretty straightforward. There's uh, this is also key. It's an unincorporated guild. It's not a legal entity. That's worth paying attention to. That's not so much for the people that are interested in the guild. That's for those of you whom out there are actually listening to this and figuring out how you're going to attempt to destroy us. So we're unincorporated. Yeah, that, that, that kind of shot a hole in that, didn't it? <clears throat> Let's talk about why the guild is viable, and especially at this point in time on the federal end. What you're looking at right now is an inspection-related timeline. This comes from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. <clears throat> this timeline dictates precisely how much time these corporations have to complete their tasks. If they do not complete their tasks, according to this timeline, they will be penalized. Not only monetarily, but if their performance drops, they will lose their contract. I want everybody to pay very close and special attention to this. You have to have X amount of trained people in the field to meet these timelines. If you do not, if you're going to hire the Craigslist crackheads out there who are going to continue to screw it up, you're not going to meet those timelines. Now, here's my hypothesis, and it's an opinion. Company A comes on the scene and decides to go ahead and grab all those contracts, and they, they hammer out in their contract with, with their people they're attempting to hire that if there's any screw-ups, you don't have the right to go back and fix it. So if you're hitting your contractor on the front end, and then after about six months, you take all the monies out of that, and you only leave the performance bond to be tapped, everybody can retire on golden parachutes with that. I don't know if that's happening right now or not. It might behoove a lot of the contractors to start looking around and start asking those questions. This timeline is specific to HUD. Virtually everybody has a similar timeline. Uh, the P260 is, uh, you know, unique to the United States government. That's their portal, for want of better words. So, the Guild. Let's talk about the Guild, how we're going to get the word out, how we're going to orchestrate change. <clears throat> the Internet. The internet, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 21st century. The largest concentration 
of the dissemination of information, news, media, whether it be audio or video, streams through the internet. The government, both domestically and governments internationally, are attempting to regulate that somewhat, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. So, the vast majority of folks like you and I, folks like you whom are listening to me this evening, get most of your information actually from the internet. So how do we reach out first and foremost and both communicate with corporations and say whom we are? You got to have a website. That's all there is to it. How do we reach out to our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues and tell them about what's going on in our mind? Social media. Twitter. Facebook. I, I despise Facebook, but it's there. We actually use Google+. Plus. <clears throat> we feel it's far more mature. The options are unlimited. I, I'm actually a developer. Uh, I do work with Google. I, I work on the source code with uh, certain Google apps. I contribute source code to Wikipedia, and I also contribute source code to the Linux project, Ubuntu specifically. Social media. This is probably the one thing that the corporations fear the most. Social media. Why is that? Because if you can get your message out to a billion people in milliseconds and it starts going what? Viral. That corporation's name for eternity is linked to whatever is put out there. Make no mistake about that. Make no mistake whatsoever. And there is no recourse. There is no recourse. Google does not censor, short of maybe China, I guess they've got some things going on there. However, domestically, Google does not censor information. Thank God. You know why? because the corporations long ago would have attempted to pay them off for whatever people's opinions are of Google. I grant them that and I am a staunch and firm supporter. And that deals with another podcast uh, about Google apps we're gonna have. <clears throat> Google empowers the small business person to have the same bells and whistles that, that corporate sites do today. For example, Foreclosurepedia streams all of its email, streams all of its applications, streams everything through Google servers. Our MX documents comport to them. Uh, we've done all of our changes, the MX records, everything like that. Let, let, let's take a look at both social media in viral. Let's look at, for a moment, let's look at Foreclosurepedia. This is a live map right now. This is everybody whom is tapping in right now. You can't record every single dot that's hitting us. We have had over three million visits. Three million. Forty-six in the last sixty seconds. Now I want you to remember this number 3093 because we're going to make sure that this thing works. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Let's go back here and talk a little bit more. So social media, you're getting your word out. You're talking about what's going on. You got to have the information out there. Blogs. <coughs> a blog is a WordPress site. It is a CMS, a content management system. They're free. They don't cost a penny. Now, you got to have somebody who knows how to install them. And if you're smart, you're going to go ahead and get with a provider that's not going to rape you. Uh, the, the guild actually spins these up. Uh, we, we spin up blogs or your CMS for your front page like we have. All your corporate email, your Google apps, uh, we slave your, your MX red, uh, records over into Google. We spin up a wiki, everything. We have that package for members. <clears throat> so when you have the blog, 
networking. You have to be able to network. If you're not networking, you're not getting anything done. And that's what we're doing tonight. That's what we've been doing since 2010, networking contractors. The LinkedIn and discussions like that, those are just really the icing on the cake. We've been doing this for two years. I guarantee you this, I guarantee you this. You want to get a job done in any amount of volume in East Tennessee, you're going to go through the guild. End of conversation. The Burt Reynolds movie about deliverance, yeah, it's pretty accurate. Make no mistake whatsoever. And that's why East Tennessee, once again, was, was the hotbed for this. It was the genesis of this idea and concept. Marketing. If you got a product, you have to market it, folks. <clears throat> we have a product, and that product is called skilled labor. The corporate view on skilled labor is that they can get the skilled labor anywhere that they want. The problem with that, and I don't know why the computer glitched on me. The problem with that, though, is that uh, they're incorrect. When we look around at a lot of these corporate structures and we pull their DUNS files and their numbers and such, what we're finding is that they must be pretty concerned about labor. We just found a company here recently that had to register for an exception to hire convict labor. Now that says a lot. I don't know how the local media is going to react to that learning now that the foreclosure property preservation industry using stimulus dollars which were supposed to help small businesses are now being squandered on felons I mean I I don't personally like the idea of my grandmother and she lives upstate I don't like the idea of and there's a couple of foreclosed homes up there. I don't like the idea of a murderer, an armed robber, God forbid any other nefarious convictions, uh, is going to be next door to her kicking in the door and then glancing over at her house. I'm not saying that the corporations are hiring these people. I am saying, though, that when you run out of skilled labor, and when you have corporations that are filing for exceptions, that it could become a problem. So we've kind of hit the whole panorama here. This is our big deal. The way that this message is going to get out comprehensively and properly is that, and remember, now we're at 3128. Just got another 53 visits. Well, look there. We got Florida, North Carolina, New York, Washington, Oakland, California. I mean, you know, they just seem to be coming from all over. Look at that. Here's where everything becomes very interesting, though. When you start getting posts over in here, for example, Berlin, you know, Great Britain, Ontario, Canada, you start getting that message out nationally and with the right application, you can spread, now we're at 31, you can spread your message like wildfire. Make no, make no mistake whatsoever, just like all of these little categories here in this little cloud that I programmed up that I can spin around, they're all interconnected everything is interconnected on the internet like wildfire we can move a message and like wildfire we can burn down the barriers which are preventing fair treatment fair pay the simple ability to go to sleep at night and know the next morning, even though we're going to put in 16 and 18 hours,
the simple ability to know that we can pay our bills. I don't think that's asking too much. You know, when I look around at a lot of the photos of the, and, and, and I want to make, make, make a distinction here. <clears throat> I am not opposed to people making profits. I am categorically opposed to obscene and unholy profits made upon my back. And I believe other contractors are as well. I believe other contractors are going to hear the call. I believe that they're also, you know, uh, we, we have a big live meetup <clears throat> on uh, YouTube. It'll be broadcast live December 19th. If you go over to the Google Plus page of mine, you can uh, uh, go over there. You can sign up. We're, we're uh, discussing options with an enormous region uh, over there in, in Nevada. And they want to talk about the guild. We're going to have people from uh, Nevada, California, Washington, Idaho, Utah, Oregon, Arizona, and I believe New Mexico. They're all going to listen in on, on the conference. So feel free. Swing by the Google Plus page. Sign up there. Once again, it's one of those sayings, you know, as contractors, you can get it for free. Uh, and, and that really is what breaks down the barriers for us now in the 21st century. <coughs> Technology for free. You know, that's what's going to level the grounds out. With that said, I've rambled enough tonight. Uh, I mean, as always, I appreciate you all tuning in. But I really want you to think. I want you to think long and hard about what is going on in this industry. Because here's the reality. For those naysayers out there whom say, well, they're just taking another dollar or two. At what point in time is enough enough? Because I'll tell you, you know, here, I mean, we, we have, we, we, you know, we bifurcated our, our business model. I can shift into other, other industries immediately. But at some point in time, you actually end up making more money working at McDonald's. I mean, that's a simple statement of fact. For example, if I go right now, AMS REO, I don't hold companies out very much. AMS pays $15 for an inspection, okay? So if I'm going to go do three inspections tomorrow, and, they're in, you know, they're 30 and 40 miles spread out, I got $45, but I'm $50 in fuel plus my food, well, hell, I could have gone to McDonald's clear today at about $90 to $100, so once again, this isn't, I, you know, I do not object to corporations making, you know, profit because that's why they're in business. Their shareholders expect dividends. But at some point in time, that line in the sand has to be drawn. And those of you whom out there want to go ahead and, and, and remain on the sidelines, feel free. Because membership, what the guild does is not just for guild members. Everything that we are working towards is to help everybody in the industry, including the Craigslist crackheads, you know, because we're all contractors. We all do this work. Foreclosurepedia has just chosen to go ahead and, and head up the situation to, to bring articulation to what is going on. And also upon conclusion, we all need to take a step back and examine how we're posting things, what we're talking about. And, and, and I always put it this way, you know, I, I hear the people say, well, company A, company B, you know, they're pieces of blank. The reality is the, the CEO, you know, generally, this is a generalization, the CEO, the CFO, COO, these people are mainly dealing with the corporate level stuff. So to just say a company arbitrarily and capriciously is a piece of blank is, is kind of, kind of, you know, off balance. Now, if the CEO is the one signing off on the cuts in pay, they're definitely a piece of blank. And they, and, and they need to be called on the carpet and they need to be held out on every social media website that there is. Make no mistake of that. There needs to be an organized and orchestrated campaign to ensure that their name is on the lips of every single mouth there is on this earth that has access to the internet. But I relate it much like this. 
In the United States, we have a tendency to state that the president is responsible for all our woes, and he's not. He's not. Congress is. Congress is responsible. But he's the scapegoat. That's not because I like or do not like the, the current administration. It, the administration to me is rather immaterial because, you know, he signs some executive orders, he shakes some hands, and he lives at the White House. Other than that, and he's going to write some memoirs, and, and, you know, he doesn't really do a whole lot. Policy is dictated by Congress. Congress is the shock callers. So when these corporations, <clears throat> by and large, the shot callers have to be identified. We need to find out whom it is that is saying we can continue to cut the throats of these contracts. So I'm going to leave you with this and then we'll close out. And this message goes out directly to the corporations whom are attempting to break our back. I want to know if any of one of you, I don't know if you have a soul or not, have any one of you ever seen the look on a five-year-old girl with tears in her eyes crying because they couldn't get any more clothing of hers into a car and her toys had to be left behind? Well, I saw that look two days ago when we helped a contractor move out of his home. Do you know why he moved out of that home? Because you people have cut the wages to such a point and that wasn't enough. He's waited 89 days for his pay, and the corporation has refused to pay him. Now, if you can go to bed and sleep and get up the next morning and look in a mirror and feel good about yourself, then I want nothing further ever to do with this industry. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to another edition of Foreclosure Pedia Podcast. <clears throat> Foreclosurepedia podcast presentation of the Foreclosurepedia radio network. Feel free to give me a shout out at COO at foreclosurepedia.org. Hope to see you December, December 19th. <laughs>